Amen. Uh, this morning we are going to be looking at uh, the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And um, there's a whole lot there. And, and I'm going to just read it in a moment. Uh, it's going to actually start with the verse before. But let me give you a little bit of the context in case you've forgotten or some of you may not have been here. Um, the, the Corinthian church had uh, their doctrine down, but they, they couldn't get their practice in order. And they had a lot of perversion. They had a lot of carnality. That just simply means they're Christians, but they weren't walking in the spirit. They were walking in the flesh. And because of that and of their lack of, uh, of getting into the truth and practicing it, they, they had an atmosphere that was hostile, that was not loving. It was... Uh, uh, a place where you wouldn't feel comfortable because they had so many factions and divisions and they were getting caught up on things that weren't spiritual. And, and Paul gets a correspondence from them and he writes this to answer much of that. And we've been looking at this as we've been going through. <clears throat> and we talked last uh, week of uh, uh, what was going on with them. Let me, let me see, I need to be there as well, don't I? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Um, uh, he, he's getting into this uh, issue that they had concerning their gifts or their functions. And we were talked about that for the last couple of weeks, two or three weeks. And, and what they had done is they had perverted some of these gifts. They were seeking some gifts that they didn't themselves possess because they were elevating the gifts above everything else. Their function became what it was all about for them. And Paul is trying to get them brought back down to understand that you have to have an attitude in order for this, this gift to be exercised properly. For you to function as God designed, you have to have a proper attitude. And that's where 1 Corinthians 13 comes in. Uh, he, he tells them it, 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 you have to have an attitude of love. Love has to pervade everything. Because it's really the only thing that's going to endure. And again, I could go into so many facets that would take us six or so Sundays to cover. But I just want to kind of condense it and wrap it up for you so you'll get the gist of this. They, they wanted to excel in their gifts and functions. And they were elevating some and perverting others. And we've talked about a little bit of that. And, and so Paul says, listen, your gifts are important. In fact, they're they're essential for the church to function. We've talked about that. But if you don't function with love, it's all pointless. It's not going to accomplish anything for you. It's not going to accomplish anything for the body, the church. It's not going to accomplish anything for, for the kingdom of God or for his glory. If you don't function in love. And he does such a magnificent job of wrapping this up in 13 verses. But I want to share with you that that just like the Corinthian church in their day, so many churches are in the same place today. They're all about their functioning and their uh, smooth machinery flowing and operating, but there's not a whole lot of love, not a lot of personal relationships. It's all sterile, it's all at an arm's distance, and it's all about function. And I don't believe after studying through this that a church can accomplish anything for God's glory without the love that that Paul brings about in this chapter. Um, Paul uh, addressed his young apprentice Timothy in the book of 2 Timothy. And, and he says, listen, I, I know some things are going to happen and I want you to be aware of this because these kind of folks and these kind of attitudes are not going to be able to allow the church to function properly. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says this. Paul does to Timothy. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times are going to come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of themselves. They're going to be lovers of money. They're going to be boasters and they're going to be proud and they're going to be blasphemers. They're going to be disobedient to parents. They're going to be unthankful and unholy and unloving. Unforgiving and they're going to be slanderers, and they're going to be without self-control. They're going to be brutal and despisers of good. And they're going to be traitors, and they're going to be headstrong and haughty, and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And I think that generation started long ago. And he says, they're going to have all that, and they're going to have a form of godliness, but they're going to deny its power. 
So they're going to promote themselves as God followers, as people who believe in God, all these who do these things. And so they're going to have this form of godliness, and they're going to put it under the banner of maybe even Christ, but, but they're going to deny its power. In other words, they're going to say it, it's, it's powerless to change us. It's powerless to help us. It's powerless to accomplish anything good from us. They're going to have all these attributes and this form of godliness, but they're denying the power of God. And he says, and from such people turn away. That, that's not conducive with members of the body of Christ, those who practice these things and these, possess these attitudes. Those are, the, the, they don't belong into the body, and so you get away from them. So certainly we could uh, deduct from that that if we see ourselves being any of this, that we got some serious problems. And we can look and say many of these that we associate with who, who have this banner of godliness, but they deny the power of Christ to change them and help them and benefit them and make them into the image of Christ. They deny that by acting this way. We, then we've got some serious things to address with them. Amen? And so this is simply what Paul is saying to the Corinthian church is you, you can think you're all that, but if you're not a loving person, then the love of God does not abide in you. If the love of God does not abide in you, then you don't abide into the body of the church. They go together. And so with that thought, let's look in 1 Corinthians. The end of chapter 12 is where I want to start in verse 31 <clears throat> because it kind of flows with the rest of it. I know we put the numbers in the chapters there, but just start in chapter 12, verse 31. We'll read through these 13 verses, and then we'll talk about it in just a moment. He says to this church concerning their gifts and them wanting the showy gifts and the static gifts and the things that, that you know, from their backgrounds elevated them. He says, listen, earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I'm going to show you a more excellent way. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I've become sounding brass or a clinging cymbal. And though I may have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but if I have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I don't have love, it profits me nothing. And he describes what real love is. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Love thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, they will vanish away. His comparison here is those gifts that you're so proud of, they're going to fade away one day. They're going to come to an end. Concerning the prophecy and the knowledge, he says right now we know in part and we prophesy in part. In other words, it's limited. We're human. And, and so we can only know as much as God allows. We can only speak as much as God allows. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. Again, it's, it's going to come to a point where those things aren't needed as well. And he gives these two little illustrations in verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. In other words, when I matured and, and, and I reached that point, and, and, and we see it as a process for a Jewish young man. It was a day. He, you had your bar mitzvah, and all of a sudden, you were all of a sudden a man. He said, you, you, you made a change. You matured to that point. He says in verse 12, another illustration, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith and hope and love. These three. 
But the greatest of these is love. Let's pray and then we'll talk. Father, I thank you for your word. It's, it's rich. It's full of meaning. It's our bread. It's our sustenance. It's what we need. Give us ears to hear and give us hearts to understand what it is you're conveying to us through this passage today. That we might become what you desire us to be so that you may be glorified the way that you deserve to be. In your most holy and precious name I pray. Amen. So, in, in this line of thought concerning their gifts and how they're perverting them, Paul says, let me, sh- the gifts are important. You know, you've perverted them and you're seeking things that you don't have. Stop all that. So instead of seeking the things the way you are in a, in a perverted way, let me show you a better way to go about this. That's what he's saying. And that's where this whole chapter comes from. Let me show you a better way than what you're practicing. Let me show you how to, to pursue this gift and your function within the body of Christ in a better way, actually in, in the only proper way. He says you can have uh, the gift of tongues, and they were really caught up with that, and we understand that. next chapter really addresses that. They were so caught up with that, and he says you may have that gift, and you may even have this I don't know what it would be, this gift of, of, with angels. I mean, angels have a certain language, apparently. You could even have that, but if you don't have love, all the language that you speak is not going to do any good. All that you know about those languages communicate, if you don't have love, it ain't going to profit you anything. He says, and, and concerning your other gifts, prophecy, where you can understand and that's just speaking forth, okay? That, that's all that means, speaking forth. It could be in, in his day and a little bit before things new. It could be the reiteration of things already made known, of God's revelation to us. And though you have that gift, and you understand all mysteries, and you have with it the gift of knowledge and wisdom that goes with it, but, and faith that believes, and, and you just, you know, you, you can have all those gifts, but if you don't have love, then it, it's not going to benefit anything. You may have enough faith that you can move mountains, literally. But if you don't have love to go along with it or to keep it tempered, then it's not going to benefit. It's not going to bless. And even if you have this attitude, I'm going to give all my goods to the poor. I'm going to show people how faithful I am and how religious I am. I'm going to give everything I have to feed the poor. But you only do it so that people will think you're something and you don't do it out of love. It's not going to profit. You could even have your body burn for the name of Christ, which really didn't happen until later on, but but he's put it in here. You you could even go to the stake and be burned for the name of Jesus Christ, but if you don't have love, it's not going to help you one bit. You're just going to burn up. It, It doesn't accomplish anything as far as God's concerned. And that's what we're concerned with. What 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 the things that God's concerned with. And so he says, listen, you, you, can, you can have these gifts. You can, you can exercise all these things. You can pursue them in a perverted way. You can exercise them in the right way. But if you don't have love, it's not the way God intended. Therefore, it's not going to bring forth its purpose. And it's just a waste. How sad it is to know you ever had something happen to you where you, you worked so hard and you were trying to accomplish something and you put so much energy and effort and time into it and when you got done... It really didn't do anything. And you look back and you said, I wasted all that time. I wasted all that money, all that sweat and tears, all that went, and it, it's useless now. It's not worth anything. That, that's what he's saying. It's our Christian life is about pleasing our Savior, living for him, glorifying his name, accomplishing the purpose for which he saved us. And, and if we get to the end of that, look, and, and we didn't have love, it's really pointless. And, and here what Paul's trying to help the Corinthian church see in this perversion that they have is that these gifts are needed, they're good, they're God-given, they're to be exercised in the right way, but if you, if you don't do it in love, it's, it's pointless because those things are going to fade away. All the gifts are going to fade away, but one thing's going to remain, and that's love. Love's going to continue in etern- to eternity. And, and we get stuck here, some people do, on, you know, uh, uh, these things uh, disappearing. I guess I'll wait and we'll get there in a minute in, in verse, at the end of verse 8. Uh, whether they're prophecies, they're going to fail. Whether they're tongues, they're going to cease 
where there's knowledge, it will vanish away. Now, there's two different verbs used there. Tongues are going to end on their own. Prophecies and knowledge, something's going to happen to make them disappear. That something happen is the perfect thing that's coming. That perfect thing that's coming is when we enter, enter to God's presence. That's at the end. That's after the rapture, after the tribulation, after the kingdom period, thousand-year reign. That's when he sets up a new heaven and a new earth. That is when those things are going to disappear. You can read in Revelation and, and several other places where there's going to be prophecy and there's going to be uh, knowledge uh, all the way through the tribulation, all the way through the kingdom period, into the millennium. There's still going to be going on. But when you come into God's presence and he dwells with us and we're in his presence in, in the finished state, that perfect thing that's coming, you're not going to need to prophesy anymore. There's nothing going to be left to be said. There's not, you're not going to have to pursue knowledge anymore. You're going to know, even as you are known. Tongues had ceased, even at this time. Uh, it was dwindling down. History proves that. The Bible proves that. But these other things were going to continue. But, but he's simply saying this. Don't get so caught up in those things because they only are going to endure as far as time does. After that, they're done away with. But love is going to continue. The only thing you're going to carry with you and you're going to have in that eternal state, that wonderful state in God's presence, is love. It's the only thing that's still going to be there. These other things are going to fade away. So as important as they are, as needful as they are right now for time, they're not going to continue. So you don't dare try to exercise your gifts and perform the functions which God has for you without love. You better get familiar with it. You better begin to practice it. And by the way, this word love is agape or agape, however you want to say it. It is not a word that the Greeks used much. It's in the Bible, but the Greeks didn't like it because it is not a fluffy kind of love based on feelings. It's not a uh, warm friendship type of love based on friendships. Th this is a love that is based on a commitment. And that's why they didn't like to use that, because if you say it's a committed kind of love, we, we don't want any commitments today, right? He's saying this is a commitment, this is a decision. I will love no matter what. So stop and think about that for just for a second. I know I'm pausing here, but God has made a decision in Christ to love you no matter what. It's a decision. You mean that I don't have to maintain a certain behavior? No, nope. if your faith is in Christ, God's committed to love you no matter how you behave. You mean I have to maintain a certain attitude? No, nope. if you're in Christ, then you can have whatever attitude you want. God's still going to love you. You can be slow in your, own, your obedience as a child of God. God's still going to love you. By the way, he says, those whom I love, I chasing right so God's love through Christ for me and for you is unconditional it is a commitment it is an agape kind of love and he's saying this is the kind of love you better start exercising in light of your gifts in light of your function because that kind of love is what's going to follow you and be with you when you get in glory and those that are in glory are going to have that kind of love so get familiar with it now if you or the best speaker of the things of God, you're not going to have to do that once you get there. If you're the best one with the knowledge to relate, you're, you're not. if you could speak in these languages, you, it's not going to be needed. But love will be. Look in verse 4, and let's do a little exercise. Verse 4 through 8, it says this, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does this, love does this. Just as I read it, put your, your name in there. So here's a, just a little example. Chris suffers long and is kind. Chris loves and does not envy. You just plug your name in there and read those. Let me just give you a second. I won't even read it. You just read it for a minute and, and see if that is true about you. Because as a child of God, Paul says, listen, church, if, you, if you're not operating this way, then something's wrong. You need to stop. Go back to your Savior and let him get things straightened out for you. Because this is the whole purpose for your salvation so that you could function as a member of the body with this kind of love. Because that's the only way I'm going to be glorified, Jesus says, is when you carry this attitude and you function in this attitude, then 
the world will see me revealed through you as a church. And that's my purpose. I don't behave rudely. I don't seek my own. I am not provoked. I see or, or think no evil. I do not rejoice in iniquity. I rejoice in the truth. I bear all things. I believe all things. I hope all things. I endure all things. The love that God has given me never fails. That's a good exercise. When things are going bad and you're having a bad day and you just feel that attitude welling up in you, stop, turn to 1 Corinthians 13, get to verse 4 and plug your name in there. If you're a child of God, I promise you pretty soon you're going to feel convicted and you're going to be repenting and you're going to get things straightened out and when you get through, you're going to walk out with a whole new attitude. Look at the verse, the rest of that, I mentioned it, where there are these gifts, prophecies, tongues, and knowledge, they're, they're all going to come to an end. And, and the prophecy and, and, and the, the, the uh, knowledge, it, it's, it's partly given to us. I mean, we have the full revelation, but, you know, there's a whole lot more about God than what he's told us. Well, what do you mean? He's, he hasn't told us everything? No, because we can't handle it. We can't comprehend it. We, we can't fathom it. But what he has given us, we can know, and so we're still going to prophesy by what we know, but it's only in part. We're going to see, and you know, their, their mirrors, he says that we see in a mirror dimly, their mirrors were, were metals that were flattened out, smoothed, and polished so that you could see a reflection, but it wasn't a, a true, accurate reflection the way we have for most, most of the mirrors. And, and he's saying we, we can kind of see in a mirror dimly right now, but then... We're going to see face to face. Now, there's no time recorded in Scripture where you're going to see God face to face until the very end when everything's done and everything's made new, see? And, and so all these other things are going to fade away, but love is going to continue. I'll know as I also am known. And, and now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is, is love. Once we coming to the new heaven and new earth we're not going to have to have faith right now we walk by faith not by sight but then we're going to be able to see the re re reality of our faith right right now we hope in God we we have this faith that God's word is true and we're hoping for this future and we're hoping for God to work all things together as his word has said but when we're there that we're not going to need to hope why, why do you hope for things that that are already in existence. You don't hope for that once you see it and realize it. it it's there. It's, it's obvious. So those are going to be done. But love, that's God's commit, committed love and grace towards us and our love and commitment to Him, right? That's going to continue in glory. And I promise you, when we get there, nothing's going to get in the way of our commitment to Him and our love to Him. Amen? And so He's saying, don't let these gifts sidetrack you. They'll puff you up. You'll, you'll think you're something. And if you think you know something, really, Paul says, you don't know anything. Because the very baseline of knowledge is knowing that you can't know everything. Right? Now, that's pretty simplistic. And so I, I, I want to I close it with that. But I want you to understand. Remember what I've shared with you last two weeks? If we're going to bring God glory, then we have to walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. And if we're going to walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh, then we have to love. Remember, and we ended last week by saying this. Are you functioning because of your committed love to Christ? And do you love every other member of this church? Remember? Now turn to John chapter 15. And let's let him close us out today. The Gospel of John. Turn back to your left. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Look in verse 15. Jesus is trying to uh, help his apostles understand that he's leaving and that they're going to have to continue trusting and listening and obeying him. And, and here's how he puts it. And, and for the, the vine and, and the branch, it's, it's very illustrative of Israel, okay? And, and they were trusting in their nation instead of the Messiah, who is Christ. All that stuff is entailed here. Let me, let me just read what he says, and I think you'll get how it connects. Jesus says, I am the vine, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. And every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes 
that it may bear forth more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear forth much fruit. So you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. And this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. But no longer do I call you servants, for a servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Does that make a connection for you? Do you understand how Paul says, if you don't have love, you're not going to be accomplishing anything for the name of your Savior. You're not going to be benefiting the church in which you are a member of, the body that you belong to, if you don't have love. And if you don't have long, something is wrong. Something's come in and clouded it all up, or something's come in and confused it all up, or, or you're carrying around hurts that haven't been forgiven or resolved, and, and you're not loving properly. And if you're not loving properly, you can't bring forth fruit. In other words, you can't exercise your gift, and, and so nothing's going to be brought forth. You, the body's going to be hindered. The kingdom's not going to be glorified. Something's wrong. And it may be, it could be, that maybe that love is not there because Christ is not there. Because where Christ is, that love reigns. So we've got to take a look and say, wait a minute. I do want to be faithful in exercising my gift. I don't want to think more about it than what I ought, but I need to be faithful as a steward to exercise it and function the way that God's asked me to so that I'm a blessing to his body, so that his name is glorified. And if I can't operate that gift without love, then I better stop and seek counsel and go to the Lord and let him fix what is wrong because this is paramount. I cannot continue without this love. And you know, all through the scriptures and, and concerning the church, we have these, these admonitions. Love one another. Be long-suffering with one another. If, if someone has something against you, go to them and talk to them and get reconciliation. If you have something against somebody else, you go to them and get reconciliation so that that can be restored so that you can love. Because if you can't love, you can't function. If you can't function, the church is hindered. And the church is hindered, the God's name can't be glorified. Y'all see how it's all tied? It's not about me, and it's not about you. It's about him. But we've got to take care of what we've got to take care of so that we can be the best we can be for him. He's worthy of that, right? So let me ask you again. Are you functioning as a member of the body? If not, I'll be glad to help you as your pastor. That's my job. If you're functioning, which is really you know, impossible, but if, you're, if you think you're functioning, are you loving? If you're not loving, then I'll be glad to help you with that if, if you'll let me. God can help you. You can go straight to him. You don't need me, but as your pastor, I want to help you however I can. But we've got to be functioning. We've got to be loving. Or you can say we've got to be loving in order for us to function. 
But if we're not in the Spirit, we're not abiding in Christ, we can do nothing without Him. Amen? And if we're not allowing His love to prevail, then we're going to be hindered, and the, therefore the body's going to be hindered. So this is very, very, very important that we understand this. If there's unforgiveness, if there's bitterness, if there's resentment, if there's any kind of issues, get it resolved. You know what I've learned? People love to hang on to their issues. Instead of reconciling them, they just like toting them around. They just like toting them around. But you know what happens when you tote around something that's heavy? And these issues are usually heavy. If you don't want to reconcile it, something's wrong. You'd just rather tote around and complain about it or fuss about it. You know what happens when you tote around something? You start kind of getting like this. And that makes your face do like this. And that's usually a dead giveaway. That there's a burden there, and that burden is something that probably needs to be resolved. Can I share something with you? Please hear me and we'll close. Life is too short. Jesus says, come and cast all your burdens upon me. I'll care for you. You don't have to tote that around. I'll help you get it resolved. I'll help you get it uh, healed. I'll, 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 I'll take care of it if you'll just follow my admonition, follow my command. You can't love one another unless you've resolved the issues that you have. We're human. We're always going to have issues. So let's get them resolved so we're not toting around the burdens. Then we can function as a church the way God intended and he can be glorified through us as he desires. Man, that's what I want him to be, is glorified through us. If you're having trouble with that, seek counsel. Go to the Lord in prayer. Let him help you. If you need further help as a pastor, I'll be glad to help you. There's many others you can go to, but I'm certainly available and willing to help you. Let, let's... Let's see if we can't get this resolved and get to the point where God can be glorified. We can function. We're abiding in, in the Spirit. We're abiding in Christ. We're not in the flesh. We're forgiving. We're resolving issues. We're forgiving each other and, and bringing restoration and reconciliation. And, and, and the love of God is going to be manifest here, First Baptist Church Savoy. Let's pray.